All right, let's get started. So good evening, everyone. It's your host, Danny Hai Fong. I want to welcome all of the viewers on my channel here. And this is a special collaboration with Radii Media. We are going to have a very fun conversation today, but a very informative one centering around the HBO series Warrior. And we're going to get into history, geopolitics, culture, and so much more. But I'm actually not going to be hosting this conversation today. I'm actually going to turn it over now to Brian Wong. He is the founder of Radii Media. And I'm very glad I met him in Shanghai. And I'm very glad to have him on this program. Before we get started, though, please hit that like button. Everyone at Radii Media, everyone here on this channel, hit the like button, share and subscribe to our channels. And we, I will turn it now to Brian. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Danny. And good morning from the East. I'm right now in Hong Kong. Um, we have a really great program. We're, we're honored and excited to be working with Danny and everyone else uh, on today's conversation. As Danny said, my name is Brian. I'm uh, founder of Radii. Radii is an independent digital media platform dedicated to sharing captivating stories that transcend boundaries, whether it be between US and China or Asia and the world. And I'm really excited about moderating today's panel, which is going to dive into one of the most talked about television series on air today, Warrior. So for those of you who haven't seen the show, and hopefully most of you have, um, but if you haven't, hey, still thanks for joining us. This is a show based on Bruce Lee's original writings. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a treatment that he wrote that never got produced. Um, it delves into the historical narrative of the Chinese immigrants in America. But what's really amazing is a lot of the content is even relevant to us all today. It's a executive produced by uh, Bruce Lee's daughter, uh, Shannon Lee, alongside uh, Justin Lin, who many of you know um, in his Fast and Furious work and many other uh, great works, um, and also producer screenwriter Jonathan uh, Trooper. So as Danny mentioned, Warrior explores the internal struggles of the confines of Chinatown communities back in the 1870s in the U.S., uh, challenges posed by Tong warfare. These are the gangs um, that existed at that time in the Chinatowns, but also sheds light on the broader U.S., um, China, and political uh, landscape that was tainted at the time by xenophobia, political corruption, bigotry, uh, and a lot more. Um, in this upcoming conversation, we're going to dive into some of the deep-rooted connections between um, you know, Chinese and Asian American history in the show. We're going to analyze some of the, the context, but also look at how the um, geopolitics of today are conjuring up a lot of similar sentiment um, now in the U.S., which I think um, is quite unfortunate. But I think the good thing is that there, there is there are ways to address this. And one of the really critical areas is through uh, culture and arts and music. And that's why we've got, uh, you know, Chops and Dana, Showtime, Burton, who are gonna talk to us about the work that they did with Warrior. So a lot to unpack. Um, and we're gonna just kick things off with the historical context and talking to Carl. Um, you know, actually, before I just dive into this, We've got Carl Zhao, who is a commentator, historian. Of course, Danny Haifeng, you all know, journalist, political analyst. And then uh, Chops, Scott Jung, uh, Chops, and uh, Dana Showtime Burton. So these, these are this is the lineup for today. Uh, I want to give proper <laughs> uh, acknowledgement of all the great sort of uh, speakers that we've got and the panelists. So let's jump into the historical context first with Carl. Um, Carl, you know, Warrior is set- Hi, Brian, uh, late... and yeah. hi, Danny. Please. Good, good, good. All right, so, um, Carl, let's just jump okay. into the historical uh, context here. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, yeah. Um, Warrior is set in the late 1800s of San Francisco Chinatown yeah. at a time- uh, Okay, so- Is there a uh, lag for, for Carl, maybe? There might be. Sorry, I apologize for my internet connection. I am in the middle of a jungle 
and uh, my <laughs> my internet is spotty and also i spilled water on my my laptop yesterday so i am using my wife's very underpowered laptop i can see the <laughs> cpu is chugging at 100 percent right now so you might experiencing a little bit choppiness but let me know if my you know delivery is being affected by that can everybody hear me okay yes uh, raise your hand maybe <laughs> hello okay i saw nodding okay great all right so uh i the you the chinese are no stranger to america uh, you know, the, the, the first contact between Ch China and America actually happened very early on. Uh, in fact, the Spanish colonization of Americas was made sustainable because of export of silver to China. Uh, you know, at the time, um, you know, one of the main enterprises that supported Spanish colonization is the extraction of mineral resources, particularly silver and gold. And China, late Ming Dynasty China was the world's number one economy. It, uh, its currency was silver. So China needed a lot of silver. So by some accounts, um, the, the silver that was mined in the Americas from 1600s to uh, 1800s in the span of 200 years, 50 percent of the silver exported from Americas ended up in China. And this was carried out by the so-called Manila galleon trade, where uh, the Spanish, will, they will load up their, the silvers they looted from the Americas, loaded on sh uh, the galleon ships uh, from the Mexican port of Acapulco, and the, the, the Mexican galleons will sail across Pacific to Manila, another Spanish colony. And the Chinese merchants from southern China will bring all the Chinese goods, tea, silver, porcelain, to Manila and to trade for the Spanish silver. And, uh, you know, add to that, there were a lot of Chinese uh, out migration to Southeast Asia, to places like Manila. Manila was um, at the time very heavily Chinese. So some of these Chinese people got on the Spanish galleon and sailed across the Pacific and ended up in Mexico. Um, at, at this time, much of the West Coast, present day West Coast United States was still part of Mexico. Um, so so, so the, the Chinese have been reported in Mexico as early as uh, uh, you know 17th century 17th 18th century and then what happened in 1848 is that United States fought the US Mexican War and he annexed much of the American West including California and this coincided with the uh, uh, California gold rush in 1848 uh, when the news got out there was gold people from all over the world rushed in you know from Mexico, from, from Germany, from, from Europe, from South America, but also from China. Uh, because right now, in 1940, it was a very tumultuous time in China. Uh, as 1840s. Many of you already know. Uh, the British wait uh, 1840s, yeah. So the British waged the, the, the Opium War on China. Um, and, and before all the, op all the trade, China carried out with the war. Western with the outside world was through one port, the port of Guangzhou, or at that time it's called Canton. Um, and I have some connection issues. And when, uh, um, uh, as a result of the Opium War, the British, um, you know, the right to sell opium to China, they also demanded China to open additional ports. The five additional treaty ports were open. So as a result of the first Opium War, a lot of the trade were shifted north from Canton, from Guangzhou, to north to Shanghai. And when Shanghai became the new trade center, the old trade network that directed all the goods to southern China got, uh, got um, interrupted. And that caused a lot of economic hardship, disruption. And, and plus, the, the whole war, Opium War, destabilize the region in the Pearl River Delta around Guangzhou when the British troops landed. And by 19, by, so at this time, a lot of the Chinese people were looking to get out. And, and when um, the, the, Qin, the, the imperial government of China actually had a ban against Chinese citizens from migrating outside, this was resulting from uh, a, a much earlier time, like a century before, um, the, the Qing imperial government was trying to cut off support for the mean loyalists, or the loyalists to the previous dynasty who had escaped to places like Taiwan, Vietnam, 
Um, and, so, and so they, they forbid Chinese to from going abroad, trying to cut off the support for the mean loyalists. But that law remained in effect up to 1800s. But by, by 18, after the Opium War, the, the enforcement of the law become lax. So some Chinese were able to get out. Some Chinese did make their way to the East Coast. And, and 1948 was a, was a very important year. But then two, just two years after, um, just two years after, after Carl. the the very deadly civil yeah go ahead let, let, go let ahead. me just interrupt Brian, you, uh, you want to say bit. something uh yeah yeah so sure i think that's that's very uh relevant context to the china side and what i what i want to do is kind of bring it to the us and what was happening there a few things you mentioned was the gold rush it was also American uh, Manifest Destiny, which, you know, they basically closed the frontier. They reached the West Coast. Uh, and then there was the construction of the Trans-Pacific Railway. So all of these things um, were happening in the time when Warrior, uh, you know, the, 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 the time frame in which Warrior kind of opens, right? 18, late 1800s. So you've, you've identified some really key points. Um, I want to kind of just uh, move it to the kind of the next uh, sort of, you know, question, which is really in light of all that was happening, the Chinese immigrants kind of going to the U.S. because of the unrest in China, the opening up of the West with the gold rush, also jobs for building the railway, um, and this whole new frontier uh, opening up in the United States. What was the dynamics of the local laborers, um, many who immigrated from Ireland at the time, uh, and the Chinese immigrants? Tell us what was happening at that time between the labor groups, the business leaders, which some refer to as Robin Barons, because these guys were making a ton of money off a lot of the business opportunities there. But they were hand in hand with the local politicians. So how was this shaping the climate in California? And, you know, talk to us about some of the policies that were being enacted, the Page Act, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. These were all relevant to the storyline of Warrior. Yeah. Uh Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, the my internet is a little bit choppy, but I think I got most of your questions. Um, I, I just if you, if you just allow me a few minutes, I'll, I'll try to tie all the threads together. Um, so so United States was always interested in having trade relationship with China because um, uh, as soon as U.S. became independent from the British Empire, U.S. got kicked out of the British Empire trade network. And China at that then in the eighteen uh, in the seventeen in the seventeen eighties was still world's largest economy. So U.S. wanted to seek a replacement for the trade with Britain. So they the, 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 they loaded up their clippers in Boston with American ginseng and fur and sailed to China to Guang to Guangzhou or Canton at the time. And and American businessmen play a big role in the trans. Pacific trade. This this is what brought U.S. Uh, 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 this is what brought Americans to the east, to the West Coast in the first place. Because back then there was no Panama Canal, so they had to sail all across, uh, sail down the South America up the coast, and they go to Pacific Northwest to trade with a, a, a fur with the Native Americans and use that fur to go trade with China. Uh, this also brought Americans to Hawaii because. Uh, Chinese desires the sandalwood that was growing in Hawaii, and and the so Americans they they were Johnny come lately to the uh, to the great power game in China. The, the British, French, they were already there. Uh, but in 1844, U.S. also sailed their gunboat and signed the Treaty of One Shot with uh, with the Qing government with a stip stipulation that whatever privilege that was previously granted to Fr French and the, 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 the British, the U.S. will receive them as well, including treaty port privileges. And um, as you mentioned, the, the kind of opening of the frontier in the 1840s, when, when uh, at the end of the U.S.-Mexican War, and uh, a, a transcontinental railroad because uh, you know, to, to bypass the need to have to run the entire South America uh, to get to the Pacific. And, and to build that trans-Pacific, uh, transcontinental railroad, you needed a lot of people because railroad building is 
very labor intensive. And the, the, the U.S. Uh, railroad barons at the time, they decided that we have a, lot, a huge labor pool right located in China and they want to get, have access to that. So this eventually led to the signing of Burlingame Treaty between the United States and, and the Chinese government. So as I mentioned, Chinese government for, for formerly forbidden Chinese people from going abroad. But as a result of the Opium War, uh, the, the British and the other European powers, they want to also want to have access to the Chinese labor. So they forced the Qing government to allow, uh, you know, China, Chinese labor to travel abroad as indentured servants. And, and then U.S., they they were a little less rampacious than the Europeans uh, because at that time U S was really the Johnny come lately and they they didn't have the kind of the muscle as like the the, the British so they, they they were nicer to the Chinese and Chinese prefer to do business with Americans than the British who they seem as right so very arrogant and and the the, the, the interesting thing about the Berlin Game Treaty it was signed by um, the. the Burlingame was a U.S. minister to Empire of China, but he made enough friends among the uh, upper echelons of the Qing court that the Qing government entrusted him as their envoy to United States. So Burlingame Treaty was yeah. signed by two Americans. It was signed by Burlingame, <laughs> who was former U.S. ambassador to China and the U.S. Secretary of State. And, and they, so the, the final result of Burlingame Treaty is that U.S., China, they will give each other most favorite. Fa fa okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say for all Go those ahead. who are from the Bay Area in California, there is a town called Burlingame near the airport. That's named after Anton Burlingame, who was the trade minister under President Lincoln, uh, then negotiated these treaties and then came back um, to America uh, as uh, once he retired, he then um, helped. Uh, represent the Qing dynasty as their trade minister to negotiate these agreements. Um, that's how loved he was by the Chinese uh, Qing uh, government at that time. But there is a direct tie to this individual in California, right outside uh, the San Francisco airport. Um, but what you're saying, um, Carl, is really, really um, interesting and you know very comprehensive. Um, I just want to make sure that we kind of get to the the key issues, then how was that shaping American politics? Because um, I want to kind of fast forward maybe a few decades after, because even though there was the Burlingame Treaty, that quickly changed when the labor dynamics between the Chinese and the local laborers became very ugly because of jobs, right? So maybe you can talk to us a bit about that. And then also right. highlight how some of yeah. these characters yeah. in the show were actually based on real historic characters. Like, um, you know, Leary uh, is based on Dennis Kearney, this, this Irish labor leader who actually existed in San Francisco. And Atong was the first madam of Chinatown um, in the historic records. And even um, I think Nellie Davenport, the woman who's saving all the uh, prostitutes from, you know, from being uh, traded, was the uh, Donna, uh, Donald, Dina Cameron, who was actually a nun who helped save these girls during that era. So maybe you could talk about all of that. Yes, yes. So um, two things were happening. United States uh, railroad baron needed Chinese labor. And a lot of the Chinese were fleeing China because Taiping Rebellion. Taiping Rebellion was a deadly civil war in the 19th century. Estimately, 20 million people were killed. And the whole Pearl River Delta region near Guangzhou or Canton was devastated. A lot of people are looking to get out. And the, 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 the Burlington Treaty, which was considered one of the more equal treaty between China and the Western power, stipu stipulated that Chinese people will be free to leave China to go to United States. And and then, the, you know, the, the, and this is really give you, but at the time, U.S. saw that as a, a good beneficial uh, treaty because it allowed the U.S. business interest to penetrate the Chinese market and bring the cheap Chinese labor to come to U.S. to build a railroad. Because one of the drive, driver behind the Burlington Game Treaty Clause is to get access to that Chinese labor to California to build the Western section of the transcontinental railroad. But once, the, uh, so when the trans 
Continental Railroad finally connected, you know, on the on the eastern side, we were, on the western side, it was mostly built by the Chinese labor. Uh, you know, when the when the railroad connected, when they make the picture, they got all the Chinese people out of the picture and just had the Irish people on film. And and this would play out when um, a lot now the railroad enabled all the white European immigrants to come to California. They realized, wow, there's a lot of Chinese here. And there's a lot of Chinese who have been brought over to work on the railroad. There has been a lot of Chinese who are working in the mining industry, you know, part of the gold rush. And they see Chinese as, as alien competitors for jobs. Uh, and, and this happened in um, uh, around the late 19th century, around 1870s, 1880s. The economy, you know, U.S. had its uh, economic depression. This was not the Great Depression, but this was, uh, you know, the earlier predecessors. The economy were were very bad. And all these white immigrant labor that came to California suddenly find, uh, a, 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 you know, the, the prospect for jobs are not as great as they thought. And they blame the Chinese. And and this is where the, the people like Dennis, uh, uh, Dennis, uh, uh, Kearney came from. Dennis Kearney himself is an Irishman, immigrant to to um, to San Francisco, and he's actually not a laborer. He is a businessman, but he very quickly, through his gift of gab, you know, because he can really stir up a crowd, he founded the Working Men's Party, and he he will end his every speech with "Chinese must go," you know, and and then um, the, you know the, the because he was. This is a problem with the U.S. from the very beginning. It's really hard to build class solidarity because of the racial divide. And, and there's also the punching down uh, uh, aspect of the U.S. politics. You know, this, these Irish immigrants, even though themselves were kind of put on the bottom rung of the hierarchy, but there's always some, someone even lower than them that can punch down, and that's the Chinese, the Chinese immigrants. And, and this, this is when um, this will be bring about eventually the Chinese Exclusion Act. And one of the thing feature about Chinese coming to America is it's mostly young men, mostly male, because, you know, it's, it's this tradition that women usually stay behind to take care of the family. And the young men, and most of the Chinese immigrants, unlike many European immigrants, they came to America not to settle. They came to America to make some money so they can send money home, back home to support their family. And eventually they will go back too. But through the layers of exploitation, because a lot of the time, they're, even though they're not strictly indentured servitude, but the way they come to America is by the so-called credit ticket system. Uh, you know, their passage to America was, give, was given to them on credit, and they have to pay that back through the wages the gang working on the railroad. And many of them are already in debt by the, by the time they landed in the United States. And because of layer of middleman exploitation, many of them don't make enough money to send money back home. And so that actually prolonged their stay in U.S. And there was a very shortage of women in this Chinese community because, as I say, traditionally Chinese women don't travel abroad. And only the wealthiest uh, Chinese merchant, they will bring like maybe a second wife or a concubine because their main wife will still be back home supporting the family. And, and then uh, this led to a proliferation of, uh, of the prostitution trade. And this is where the madam... Atoy came from. Adam Atoy was a real Chinese woman in uh, San Francisco. He, she came to United States with her husband, but her husband died on the, in the passage on the ship, and she became the mistress of the captain. And the captain gave her so much money. So by the time she landed on California, she, uh, she was already a, a wealthy. And then she spotted a business opportunity when she saw like there was a dearth of women, and all the men were looking at her, sizing her up. So she started the first peep show in the West Coast, and she would charge all these gold miners a one ounce of gold to, to see her peep show. And, and so she became like this, uh, 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 like a brothel runner, and uh, and and she she was, you know, as you say, she was one of the character on the show. This was a real historical person, and and the, and also the the Dennis Kearney is also a real historical person. Of, very anti-Chinese uh, 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 labor leader, even though he himself is not a proletariat, he was just a, a, a populist, you know, like, like many of us today could relate 
too. He he railed against the big business and robber barons, uh, even though himself was a business owner. But he was capped to, um, he was uh, leveraging all the discontent of the working class. Except he yeah. directed against the immigrant, particular Chinese immigrant, because by 1880s Chinese were uh, there were 300 Chinese in South California. It's consisted of about 10. One tenth of California uh, population. I'm sorry. You want to have, have another question? Sorry. No. Did you have no, no, question? Carl. I was going to say you've got encyclopedic uh, knowledge of this information. I'm very impressed, and and I think you've given a really good overview of what the context was historically in the time frame that sort of um, warrior kicks off, and you've identified the dynamics in China. The dynamics of the laborers, um, both the local European ones and the new arrivals from China, and then the political dynamics that were taking place um, that were really shaping, uh, you know, the, the countries um, and how they are interacting. Initially, thanks to Anson Burlingame, a very positive, constructive sort of engagement, which I think historically is amazing, and I, I, I wish more people knew about this character because that was that was quite um, unique in, in the history. But then how that quickly shifted by 1882 to one of the most um, you know discriminatory policies um, targeting spe a specific group in U.S. history by 1882. The Page Act was also focused on actually uh, stopping women from Asia and from China specifically to moving to America for fear that you know these laborers would get settled into America. There was all also this talk about the conflict of values, um, something that we're hearing um, a lot today. Which, if you don't mind, Carl, I'm going to move to Danny now, and, and, and kind of talk about how um, today's U.S.-China tension is actually conjuring up some of the similar sentiment of um, you know what we heard about a hundred years ago, and so. Danny, if you don't mind, fast forward to say U.S.-China has gone through immense changes in their relationship. Um, you know, transformations benefiting each other and the world, I'd say for the last 20, 30 years um, in terms of how they've collaborated economically. But somehow, you know, in the last whatever five years, this bridge of trust and mutual respect has really changed dramatically. And I wondered how this bilateral tension now is impacting the way Americans see Chinese and Chinese Americans or Asian Americans for that matter in our own country, the US, because I, I think it's safe to say almost all of us on this panel are, are Americans. So uh, we're all very much a part of this. So would love to get your thoughts on that. And thank you, Carl, for, for your great sharing. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's a huge question. I think one of the biggest differences now, uh, and, and Carl did give a hugely important overview of the history of the period that Warrior is placed in, and I think the biggest difference now from then is the fact that the relationship between the U.S. and China is no, one, no longer characterized by humiliation. So uh, during the period of w warrior, the 1870s, uh, China was amid this century of humiliation that left so many Chinese impoverished and, and helped facilitate that mass migration out of China. Today, the relationship is a lot different because China is on the rise. China's economy is fast growing. And in the next five to 10 years, the entire world will acknowledge China as the biggest economy in GDP terms. The U.S.-China relationship is hundreds of billions of dollars. I believe it's over $600 billion in trade volume. But that is going down now, and that's because the United States has been waging what is a hybrid war on China. It's a multifaceted campaign to try to contain China's rise. And so while the cooperation between the U.S. and China has certainly been fruitful, it has been fruitful for American businesses, there, are, there is a lot of consternation on the part of U.S. corporations uh, uh, on this economic war and even on the military tensions because they're all related. But at the same time, there is this larger geopolitical aim with regard to China that is not 
is not acknowledged too much here in the United States among ordinary people because the Western mainstream media, in particular the U.S. mainstream media, has a wall-to-wall coverage of China characterized by simply anti-China sentiment, anti-China messages. There is you cannot find positive coverage or even neutral coverage of China within the pages of the New York Times or on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. Forget about it, because when it comes to partisan politics, uh, there are on, there's only one strain of thought on China, and that is that China's rise is bad. But certain outlets like Fox News play the anti-communist card, while the more liberal class, the liberal corporate media, We'll talk more about China's rise as being a quote unquote threat in a more benign manner, or we'll use terms like authoritarian, Cold War rhetoric, for example. And we even see that with U.S. President Joe Biden, who directly after diplomatic visits that the United States is supposedly conducting after Antony Blinken went to China, uh, uh, you had Joe Biden call Xi Jinping, the president of China, a dictator. And now you have Uh, Joe Biden going off about how the Chinese economy is a ticking time bomb. And that means that Chinese leaders who are bad people are going to start doing bad things. And this is the narrative now that is shaping American public opinion. And there has been a lot of research done over the years, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic, that has been tracing the rise of Uh, so-called hate crimes, which could really just be seen as attacks on Chinese people and all Asian Americans and people of Asian descent who are arguably being targeted as Chinese. And these attacks have risen as the United States has escalated its hybrid war on China. That is an information war. It is one that is just wall-to-wall anti-China propaganda all across the Western media landscape. It's also an economic war. So when U.S. presidents and U.S. politicians talk about China's economy as being a quote-unquote threat, there is policy to back it. There are sanctions. There's a trade war. There are all sorts of policies meant to quote-unquote decouple, or now they're saying de-risk from China. And all that means is separating the United States economy from China and also reinforcing this message that China, the Chinese government, and Chinese people uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in the crossfire are uh, really a threat and hurting the U.S. economy. So similar to that period, the 1870s, a century of humiliation, and of course, what was going on here in the United States where Chinese people were being scapegoated, a similar trend is happening, even though conditions are by far different, where China is rising. China is a competitor. However, China doesn't see itself as some sort of antagonistic player on the world stage with the United States. It has only been calling for more cooperation and to ease tensions. But there is this existential crisis that did not exist over 100 years ago where now China is seen as almost the the second coming of the Soviet Union, except one that is not falling, that is not on the decline, and where the U.S.'s policies economically, militarily, with this military buildup in the Asia-Pacific, they're not working to the effect of weakening China. Actually, what's happening is China is becoming even more connected to the rest of the world, the more that the United States tries to push China into the corner. So there's a lot of danger to this because eventually there's only one conclusion to the way that the United States is treating China, and that is out and out war. But the consequences now are already being felt, whether it's the economic situation worldwide, where the the trade war where sanctions, all of these policies are having ripple effects across all, 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 all of the world. And then the consequences here in the United States, where American public opinion, public opinion toward China, and by extension, some people argue against this. Oh, well, Chinese people are different from the government. 
that does not take into account the fact that the United States has this century plus long history, not just treating China as a country that deserves to be humiliated, but then as throughout the whole Cold War, as an existential threat to the very existence of quote unquote democracy and the American way of life. That's been the case for more than a century. And now over the last 70 years, since 1949, since New China, that Cold War sentiment never really went away. And the minute that it needed to be stirred up because China's rise is being is seen as an existential threat to the U.S.'s hegemony and existence and dominance around the world, it has been whipped up again with ferocity. And this time the stakes are incredibly high because this U.S.-China partnership is so robust. And for the fact that the situation historically is different. China is not where it was in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. It wasn't where it was in 1970, right? China is uh, completely at a completely different stage of its development. And that means that the United States is actually the one finding itself backed into a corner, which makes the vitriol and the rhetoric and the targeting and the scapegoating of China and by extension Chinese people that much more important. And the consequences are more hate, more um, attacks, more dehumanization, and of course, uh, more uh, propaganda that marches the United States as a whole toward the direction of war. Uh, sorry, Brian, you were muted. You're muted. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. No. Thank you, Danny, for pointing that out. That the the um historical context difference 100 years ago versus today, yet some of the outcomes feel like they're very similar. Um, you know, you, you, you referenced this, but we know oftentimes political rhetoric of the time doesn't always capture the essence of how the people themselves feel about one another. Um, and, you know, judging from how many Chinese students um, studied in America or are interested in studying in America, um, you know, there's clearly an interest in American culture from the Chinese side. And I know there's always been talk about, you know, you know trying to create more interest from the American side in kind of Chinese culture and language. But one of the things is that the Pew studies recently, I'm sure you're familiar with these, that, that, that poll attitudes towards one another, like how Americans view China and Chinese view Americans, um, doesn't really reflect a lot of positive trends that are taking place. And so I guess my question to you is, what role does media and public rhetoric play in shaping this dynamic? And what can we learn from Warrior uh, in that regard in terms of, you know, kind of the storyline and how you see all these things interacting, what you see happening behind the scenes um, and, you know, how, how we can kind of just be more aware so that we can kind of filter out um, the, the noise from the signal. Well, it's my understanding that Warrior was a project that was very difficult to get off the ground. And I think Warrior itself shows just how difficult it is, what stage we really are at, where we really are at on this question of China and just in general, uh, race relations, political relationships, social relationships with regard to some to a show like Warrior. And I think the way that the media is uh, sort of at fault here or plays a huge role in the deterioration between the United States and China and the conditions on the ground, Brian, which you state, it, it's, it's true. It is 100 percent correct. All of the Pew studies, all of the Gallup polls, all the polls on how Americans view China uh, they are only go getting worse and worse in terms of disapproval toward China. And, and that that shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who reads the Western mainstream media or follows the U.S. mainstream media. And uh, the, the public opinion trend, this dip in public opinion, it shows that there really isn't public media in the United States. Uh, these privately owned media companies, this concentration of misinformation, that's what we have in the United States, it's following the diktats, uh, these, these conglomerates, they're following the diktats of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, they 
uh, find that relationship beneficial. And so what they do is they just continuously over and over and over again, uh, promote this idea of China being a quote unquote threat. And even when China is doing something positive for the world, whether it's cancer research uh, and actually trying to find a cure for cancers, whether it's poverty alleviation, whether it's breakthroughs and technologies, it's always but at what cost? And, and that's kind of the narrative that we are getting now each and every day. And a show like Warrior, I think, really highlights it. it, it and I think, I, you know, if you watch it and you then you see, you read the reviews, you read about the time period, the scapegoating of China is very interesting from that period to this one, because there are so many similarities. If you if you do watch it, you'll feel it. You'll feel how much the the sentiment is so similar now that it's the same root. It's the same cause. It's the same kind of scapegoating and hatred. It's few that fuels conflict. But at the same time, now the problem for the United States and what pro what makes, I think, this rhetoric even more incendiary in some ways is that it's hurling. It's almost like hurling pasta at a brick wall. Like it's not going to stick. Um, but at the same time, um, it's a very hard surface. And that's what China is there. It doesn't really stick because China's rise is unquestionable. It's there's the most of the world can see it. Most of the world understands what's happening. If it wasn't for the war in Ukraine, that conflict, uh, it's likely that Europe's posture would be a lot different right now. Maybe not so much different, but it might be a little bit different given its position has fallen so far since the Ukraine conflict. But at the same time, China's rise is so unquestionable that it, it really shows the hypocrisy and I think the uh, absolute uh, a geopolitical quandary that the United States finds itself in and what makes the misinformation that much more important. Without this misinformation, it would be very difficult to break off the relationship or to, uh, uh, or to escalate conflict in the way that the United States is doing so now. Because the truth is, is that the U.S. population is actually quite war fatigued. There isn't a lot of desire to get into more and more conflict. So it takes a heavy amount of misinformation, a heavy amount of branding. You have to brand China a certain way, similar to how warrior Chinese people are branded in the local media, by local politicians, um, uh, uh, business owners as un inhuman. Uh, you know, this, this is happening now to China. China is being seen as this inhumane, other that must be uh, contained, weakened, and outright destroyed to preserve the American way of life. And only that message sent hundreds of thousands of times over the course of a year where each and every Western mainstream media outlet picks up each other's stories. Only that kind of misinformation campaign, it's a psychological operation really, can push people to think about China like this because it's, it's actually changed quite a bit. People in the United States were not thinking about China so negatively 20 years ago even. The, the opinion about China was a lot more favorable up until, I would say, the last yeah. decade when the Obama administration declared the pivot to Asia and there was a renewed interest in great power competition and building up uh, toward a conflict with China and, of course, Russia not far behind. So it wasn't until this period where it became so important to demonize China, to make China look like the other, to make China look like it is the singular evil or maybe the foremost evil among a uh, whole new axis of so-called evil as, as uh, Bush II would have us believe or, or originally stated. It wasn't until this period, the last decade or so, where it became so important for the media itself to hone in on this anti-China messaging in order to push for these geopolitical objectives. The biggest one 
being to weaken China. And that has had so many consequences from the witch hunt now. The Department of Justice has waged a witch hunt on Chinese scientists. You have Chinese mm -hmm. students going back to China. They, a lot of them do not want to stay in the United States. The Confucius Institutes, many of them have been closed. Uh, the China Initiative under Donald Trump, which was partly uh, a big uh, reason why so many Chinese scientists and professionals were targeted by the Department of Justice, that really hasn't gone away. This atmosphere of fear, this climate being built up, and, for, and we can't even forget COVID-19, where Chinatowns, uh, New York Chinatown, San Francisco Chinatown, but especially New York City Chinatown, was basically uh, put into a recession before there were any lockdowns and any policy toward COVID uh, because COVID-19 was in China. There was a lot of, there was just a vitriolic anti-China media campaign during the first months of COVID in China. That led to people in the United States, in particular New York, they stopped going to Chinatown and that increased yeah. dramatically the poverty there. And so this is the effect of the media. The media really can shape policy, especially when it's so concentrated and when it's so in league with the political and geopolitical objectives of the United States government. Thank you for that, um, Danny. Appreciate your insights. Um, very comprehensive uh, in terms of giving us a perspective of the role of media uh, and the politics around this. You guys might be feeling a bit discouraged given you know what a challenge we have before us, but you know part of this conversation is really to talk about you know, what can we do to address this in a constructive way? And that's why we've invited uh, two very um, uh, special uh, guests as part of this conversation. We have uh, Dana Showtime Burton, who's uh, based in Shanghai, a music producer, and uh, Scott Chops Jung, based in Philly, uh, who is uh, a very, uh, is a veteran uh, music producer who's worked with the likes of Kanye West and Nicki Minaj and many others, and was the first um, Asian American music group to be signed on um, uh, it, it, with a major label in the US. So these guys have been involved with Radii on the music side. And I'm gonna start with Dana. Um, Dana uh, is back with us. Yep, good. Uh, Dana, you've been at a fascinating intersection of music and culture during more than, I don't know, was it almost 20 years in China. You brought freestyle rap to China in many ways through your Iron Mike productions. Tell us how music has been a bridge of cultural understanding in your experience and for those involved in Iron Mike. And, you know, I know you're from Detroit. So, you know, you moved from the United States to China and then you brought this art form uh, to China and it's it's blossomed into some amazing things. So, so share with us, uh, you know, your experience and perspective. Peace and blessings, love and light, reporting live from the beating heart of the dragon in Shanghai. This is Dana Burton, a.k.a. Showtime, Godfather of Iron Mike. Shout out to Danny. Shout out to Kyle Job, my man Chops, and Brian. Uh, thank you for putting this together. Um, you know, reflecting upon what we just heard, it's so much to process, especially if you're not from the Chinese community and you're not connected to China. And most people are not processing this information. And what it feels like for someone like myself, just a, just a regular average American dude that's engaging with China, having this incredible experience, dealing with people, doing what I love, promoting hip hop. The current climate is so intense and so extreme and stressful. Uh, I feel like I'm in the midst of two superpowers that are on the verge of a major clash. And at its, at its extreme, it's portrayed as a clash of civilizations. So that context is important because it bears on, um, you know, the everyday people. Just trying to have basic people-to-people -people connections, uh, much less try to do business or try to live on both sides uh, of the divide is very difficult. And through art and culture and music and entertainment, it's truly helping us have 
some very difficult conversations. Uh, I think art and entertainment and music, it has the ability to allow people uh, to engage in these topics with a bit of distance. You get an audience that may just be looking at it for entertainment value, but slowly you'll be able to pull them in to the emotions uh, you know, that are behind some of these conflicts, which are really life and death situations. And so through this culture of hip hop, it's helped destroy taboos. It's helped us build bridges. And particularly with hip hop and a culture like battle rap, it's allowed us to engage in heated debates with no limits, where you can have conversations that you couldn't have any other place. And, get, and through these conversations, we're building friendships and bonds and we're building community. In the case of uh, the Iron Mike, I've been in China over 25 years now. And the battle has been going for 22 years. And what we've done is nothing short of a whole of society transformation. We have changed China. And we did that because we as a community created new things. We invented things. We created, we created new technologies together. Hip hop is a technology. And seeing is believing. Me talking about it on the screen, um, for some of the viewers, you're going to have your doubts. Um, I, I would recommend you to go check out a film by Damon Dash called We Went to China. Uh, also check out a film, The Story of the Iron Mike. It was done by Vice. And there's been some articles talking about the Iron Mike story by Jeff Tang in Foreign Policy. And surprisingly, you can find countless academic articles about the Iron Mike. So th the scholars have been studying it and, and are baffled by it. It is a story yet untold. And... I just want to salute Carl and uh, Danny. They've invited me on their show. And when they invite me on their show, I actually want to talk about politics. I want to talk about the geopolitics and the political tensions and share my knowledge and insights of what's going on. These guys are like, tell us about your experience being black in China. Or Carl's like, tell us about hip hop. We want to know about the hip hop story. And I'm appreciative to have the chance to talk about that. And I can go on their shows and I could talk for an hour, two hours. We have these lengthy conversations. And I feel like the type of listener that wants to listen to that is, is, is generally the same type of person that would read a book, that would sit down and read a book for a couple hours. And the reality is this new generation uh, that's coming up, they don't have the attention span. And what we find what we can do with music in uh, particular, we can reach a broader audience uh, we can con I can condense in two minutes what would probably take five hours to talk about with Kyle and Daddy. I can put that in a rap song. We can make a music video about it, and we can reach millions of people. And th that's what we've been doing here in China. I started these rap battles, these underground battles, um, just in Shanghai, the city. And then we've expanded to hundreds of battles across the country a year. Uh, and multiply that by 23 years, we've impacted thousands of people that have all gone on to be ambassadors of their community and creators uh, where they're sharing their stories. And through this culture of hip hop, because all of these people all over China love this culture, they were able to learn something about the black experience in America that opened them up to me. That opened up a door, a window, where I could have intimate access into all of China. And I've been traveling the whole country, renting the country for decades, uh, maxing out like 400, 500 shows a year. And, uh, you know, what, what we were uh, tasked to do when it came to um, Warrior was to provide the ending song of the episode. So on one level, we we're providing this music that captures the essence of the entire episode. And uh, this is the power of music. Then on a second level, you're actually, and, and I think this is something that's gonna take time for the listeners that are enjoying the show, they're caught up in the moment, and they have this big climax scene, finale scene, where the music really pulls it all in together and, and, and it captures all these emotions. And then they start to think, wow, like that, that music was really cool, that was amazing. Who did that? I want to learn more about that artist and learn more about that story. And then the next layer of the onion is you start to learn about these artists. And maybe you look for the translations in English of what they were saying in Chinese. 
and you get to hear their real life story. So you're telling stories on multiple levels and you're engaging with people and you're actually bringing them in uh, with real world connections. And we've done nothing short of, of defy the odds with hip hop um, and, and what we've done with the Iron Mike and this collaboration. And the, the, we, we have an opportunity and a platform to engage in these, like you said, these really tough issues that we're talking about with immigration, the rise in Asian hate, uh, you know, all the, all the conflict and tension that came out and the divide that came out of the pandemic, um, the political issues. Hip hop is bridging the gap. And right now there's a man in Dubai. He's playing an important role working on uh, new China clean energy at this company. He's a global player. And I have a personal connection with this guy because he joined the Iron Mike rap battle. He actually met his wife at the rap battle. He competed with some of the biggest rappers in China, and now he's moved on to something else and is a major inf influencer in an important field in technology. And we have that connection where we can, uh, we don't have to get distracted by the politics of what they say, because I know that dude, that's my homie, that's my man. I know him, we built a bond through hip hop, and now we can deal with these issues, we can engage in trade and, 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 and multiply his story by hundreds of thousands of people, ambassadors in every city. And these are the type of people, me and Chops, who, who pulled me in to this whole project in the first place. These are the young people that we're connecting with that are making this music that ultimately more and more Americans need to know, need to connect with and build bridges with. And so I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll land there if there's, if there's more questions. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Dana. Great sharing. I wanna move now to one of the OGs of hip hop, uh, Scott Chops Jung. Ch Chops, you got a really interesting story. I think we can devote a whole episode to your life, but suffice it to say, you're a, you're you're a pioneer in many ways. As I mentioned, you were the first Asian American music group to sign with a major label, but you've also produced music for, for some of the great hip hop artists in America, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and you were critical in kind of linking up, you know. Dana and, and his artists with the show Warrior. Uh, tell us about the role you played in helping connect hip hop artists from China to Warrior, the statement that it makes as a contribution to this bigger picture and message of the program. And maybe you could tell us about some specific songs that capture kind of, you know, how you crafted this all together. Um, you know, just give us a perspective. Uh, you're muted. Chops, sorry. Yes, mute. Am I? Oh, I, 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 I just unmuted you. Sorry. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, yeah, I, um, I've, been, I've been doing music for a long time. My group started out, you know, uh, late '90s, um, and I've been producing. I make the tracks, the the beats and stuff for for my group, and then I went out to work with various other people over the years. Um, and in time, uh, I ended up um, focusing on uh, making songs and and uh, for for television shows and for for movies, um, it's it's it kind of combines my two interests, you know, uh, just making music, hip hop, and then also uh, I've just always been a big fan of TV and and movies, like we all are. But uh, for me, uh, my, the only job that I've ever been able to hold for for any length of time were at um, recording studios and like a movie theater. I made popcorn and all that stuff. Um, so so yeah, uh, late as of late, I've I've really found that. Um, that working on um, music for for uh, for shows and and movies is is my focus. And so um, there was there was uh, a fellow that had um, a guy by the name of Dan uh, Dan Farkas. He had um, he had liked some music that I'd done for uh, that landed on an HBO show, uh, The Night of. And he he pulled uh, he was he's involved on. Uh, a warrior he's he's uh the the in the music department for warrior and and had the folks there uh reach out and because they were looking specifically for um chinese hip hop uh chinese language hip hop and um and i was able to connect with some of the artists that i know uh here in here in the us who speak chinese and uh, and rhyme in chinese um uh, jason chu lohai uh, uh alan z um and some others um but one thing that i really really wanted to do is i is 
many, many years ago, uh, over a decade ago, maybe 15 or more years ago, uh, Dana and I had been in touch, Showtime and I had been in touch just over the, over the internet, you know, and, and we talked about like joining up, working on something, uh, creating, you know, just sort of like the possibilities of, of what we could possibly do together, you know, and, and we never, we never had that chance, you know, we never had the, the opportunity to do it. Um, and, and warrior kind of gave us that opportunity, you know, um, and, um, just just knowing uh dana's history with with hip-hop he's from detroit like which is kind of like one of the 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 centers in america of battle rap you know um and just knowing that um just knowing his deep history in china with hip-hop and just him being like a pillar of hip-hop in china uh it, it really made sense to to hit him up and ask him like, look, like, you know, is, is there something we can do? I know there's folks that, you know, I know there's great, uh, you're, you know, you have great relationships with like legendary artists, folks that are like up and coming folks that have been doing it for like decades. Um, and, um, and yeah, so we got working, you know, we got making songs, we got making, um, uh, and, you know, and eventually that led, led to um, the folks at warrior kind of, uh, recognizing uh that there was a real uh, a resource you know some something unique with what we were doing and um and one of the things that that is really excited uh exciting for me is that we've been um we've been able to like Dana was saying um have songs where we where it's not just the feel or the vibe of the of the track which is which is my part of it the musical aspect of it that that kind of fits the episode, the episode, and and what's going on in the show, but like the messages of the show itself, you know, which is which is, um, you know, it on the surface of it, it's a kung fu, it's a kung fu movie turned into a TV series, right? But like with with the layers of the stories and with <clears throat> with um, everything going on, I mean, it it touches on a lot of the stuff you guys discussed, where you know um, the these barons are are really pitting us against each other right and 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 there's that's really similar to what's going on these days where there's there's people that that hold a lot of power and a lot of money um are are pitting us against each other right and and really like the common man the you know the, us the workers are like we're we're there's there's only so much available to, available to us and we're fighting over it you know what I mean? Because it's limited and because we've been taught that the that the other one that's in the same position as us, the other person, the other man across from us, because they're from a different place, because they look slightly different than us, you know, they they're the enemy. So um I mean those those themes are are throughout the show. And um, you know, and and it's I, f I find it brilliant that they're able to pull that off, that they're able to like have a show that like, you know, I'm watching it to to see somebody get kicked in the head but i'm getting a lesson at the same time you know what i mean um and uh for us um the chance to be part of that and also deliver not just musically um but lyrically some of what's going on and some of the messaging that that you know like some of the points that are being made about society um you know again like dana said if you if you if you speak chinese or if you um you know find the translations get it translated you can you can see that like these these artists are like it's not just people that like just started with rap these are like people who have been dedicated to hip hop you know it's people that are lyricists it's people that it's artists that have like depth and and uh and metaphor and you know and rhyme scheme and and like all the things that um that that hip-hop artists true true artists from anywhere you know I've, I've been blessed to work with folks all around the country here but like also different places you know uh korea africa um germany different places and um i mean just being able to work with dana and and be connected to such like uh a wellspring of of incredible artists is is amazing and I, and i think i think it helps the show
you know, I think I think I think that we help out a little bit. For sure. I think it adds a whole different element to the show uh, through through the music and the fact that these artists are actually, um, you know, so diverse in terms of the, you know, you've got American artists, but you've also got, you know, Chinese artists that are all celebrating this same culture of hip hop and their music style. I think Dana also um, has some minorities from uh, China that that are featured in those uh, tracks. So, um, you know, Charles, I think you addressed a really key issue here, which is how entertainment um, can really engage audiences first, maybe for the entertainment value, just the action and and and, and the um, you know the visuals and maybe even the music. But then there's something underlying that which is more significant, and hopefully, a portion of the audience will both enjoy the show but also take something away from it. Um, and so, you know, I kind of want to wrap up here um, with a final question for you guys. Um, Shannon Lee, the daughter of Bruce Lee, who's the executive producer of uh, The Warrior, said that not that much has changed. Yes, we have better technology and faster cars, but how we treat one another, not much has changed. We are mirroring the current climate and the times with a show that took place a hundred years ago. Okay, so that's what she said. Uh, and I was, thought it was quite astute, but I wondered, you know, do you guys agree with that? Um, yes or no, and you know, what can we do if some final thoughts in terms of moving forward on how to address this, whether it be through arts, culture, or anything else that we do in our everyday lives. I, I'm gonna go through each of you from Carl to Danny, and then finish up with Dana and Chops. Hopefully you get some final thoughts because this has been a fantastic conversation. Um, and I, I just kind of wanna hear what you guys have to say on this, this quote. Oh, I, I'm on screen. Okay. Um, so I, I absolutely agree with the, with what Shannon Lee said. There's eerie parallels between what happened in the late 19th century and today. You know, back then, the United States, a lot of the robber baron uh, tycoons saw China as a place of a market and abundant source of labor. And and then yet at the moment when the U.S. economy turned south, when U.S. was experiencing a series of depressions in late 19th century, then all this Chinese suddenly became the scapegoat for all the social ills in the United States. You know, we, we see parallels, as you guys already mentioned, COVID um, back in the 19, 1970s, 1880s, the Chinese. Chinese were seen as a vector of spreading disease. American medical associations claiming that Chinese are bringing disease that themselves somehow have immunity to, but will endanger the white people's health. And, and, and this is why the Page Act was enacted because they see the Chinese women who work in the sex industry as a possible vector to infect the white men who patronize the, these Chinese brothels to, uh, you know, that will bring the Chinese disease to the white community. And this is one of the reasons they were given to, to ban uh, the Chinese women from coming to America. Uh, of course, the other reason is they don't want Chinese to settle down and, and have children. And, uh, and, and, and another, another thing I need to mention is that um, uh, because this was a result of the 14th Amendment, because right after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was enacted to grant rights of anyone who was born in the United States was naturalized as U.S. citizens are U.S. citizens. So suddenly they weren't prepared for these possibly these uh, uh, these Chinese coming over. The possibility that that they might have family and and have children who will grow up as American citizens, um, and, and and this led to a lot of the anti-Chinese violence, which we are also seeing today. Uh, you know, one of the um, uh, 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 crucial early uh, act. The, in the people versus Hall, when uh, the people the people of the state of California versus George Hall, when a George Hall who, who was accused of killing a Chinese minor and and he was initially convicted uh, on 
the wit was but the three trial witnesses were also Ch Chinese people. So George Hall challenged the the ruling because he because at the time the, the racist law says Black American and uh, Native American cannot stand uh, bear witness against white man. George uh, Howe argued that this should law should extend to the Chinese, and the, the, the California Supreme Court agreed with them. And, and this basically um, uh, made it very permissible to attack the physical person of the Chinese immigrants in the United States. I mean, that still goes on today. And, and you know, all the, the, all the blaming on, on China, whether for, for, for uh, and Chinese, whether for spreading disease or, or whether for spreading social ills, that goes on today. And uh, as for how to counteract that, I think the best hope is offered by people like Dana and Chops through people to people exchange, through share of common culture, and, and by us here talking about it. You know, we, we need to raise our yeah. voice and, 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 and challenge the main, uh, the, the whatever mainstream narrative that, that there is. Thank you so much, Carl. Great insights. Again, man, you got all the historic information in, in, in your head there. Walking Encyclopedia, really appreciate uh, you giving us context. And there's so much of this history we're not aware of. And to be honest, like, even if you're not Chinese um, or Asian American, this context is important because, you know, the plight of the Chinese 100 years ago became the plight of the, the Mexicans that came as laborers. And, you know, there's there's a lot of um, collaboration that happened uh, during the civil rights time between um, Asians and, and blacks, actually. Hiram Fong, a lot of people don't know who he was, but one of the first and only Chinese Sen American senator uh, worked very closely um, with the human rights activists to uh, push for a lot of the, the change at that time. So we all need to be aware of these things. We all need to work together. Um, and um, this is for the betterment of, of not just America and China, but the world as a whole. Let's um, move to Danny. Um, Danny, what are your thoughts on the quote and also ideas and suggestions? By the way, someone brought up a comment like, how do we you know, help our, our local Chinatown communities? I think that's also a very good point. Like, you know, people are suffering now post COVID and anti-Asian hate. So I appreciate people's comments in the group. Take it away, Danny, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, well, the question is, is a good one. And uh, I would say my answer would be uh, yes and no. Uh, I think the root causes are the same. And I think we are seeing a lot of almost like modern manifestations of what had transpired during the period that Warrior takes place in, during the uh, migration of Chinese workers to the United States, the century of humiliation in China, et cetera. We're seeing a lot of the same root causes play out now, and a lot of it can really boil down to uh, the United States' system of exploitation and its system of exploitation that does rely upon conflict. It relies upon class conflict it replies it relies upon geopolitical conflict and that is definitely occurring today so there is no doubt that there is so much resonance with uh, the themes in warrior now the world is a much different place at the time that warrior took place the united states was becoming an industrial powerhouse it was becoming an empire in many respects it was developing rapidly and was coming off the heels of a civil war. That's uh, one element of this, a civil war that was really a battle of, uh, it, uh, of industry. It was a battle for industry to take center stage in the United States. And of course, the question of slavery and, and race relations, racism, etc. Uh, that was also a huge part of it. Now, in terms of what is different is that the the world is no longer in a position where the united states is going to be the it's no longer a rising power and it's no longer going to be a hegemon for very uh for for very long there is a path of decline that the united states is headed in and 
I think one thing that resonates so much about Warrior is that regardless of if an empire is on the rise or whether it's on the decline, the policies tend to be very similar. The scapegoating of Chinese people, of Asian Americans, the violence against them, the dehumanization of them, uh, that's a historical thread. That's existed throughout the duration of U.S. policy toward Asia, yellow peril, then the Cold War, mix that all together and you get what we have now, but in the circumstance of American decline, where living standards are dropping, the economy is shrinking, and the need for endless war is growing higher and higher because, as Carl was saying about these moguls and uh, these monopolists and and the, the the this era of concentrated capital that was occurring at that time during the period of warrior now you have this occurring and it's getting more and more acute but it's happening in the context of rather than the united states being a rising power being one that can modernize that can reform itself and that could pos and that can possibly change economic relationships for its own stability now we are seeing that the united states just doesn't really have that capability and the more and more this is becoming uh, uh recognizable especially among the elite the more and more we see uh, the uh, warfare the reliance on war the reliance on aggression the reliance on uh, racism and on dehumanization, the more and more we see that become almost like a, de a desperate attempt to maintain what I, I believe was never what the United States deserved to have because a lot of this wealth is, is stolen. And it's stolen uh, from the people who, who uh, of course, uh, not just these folks, but especially the Chinese uh, uh, laborers that we're talking about here from that period. And uh, of course, all of the working people from Africans who were enslaved. And now, of course, to the entirety of this huge global majority of, of working people that are literally uh, building the wealth that the United States stands on. Uh, this economic order is just untenable at the moment. So when you have a country like China rising and doing things differently, I think the, the that is the biggest difference we see today. It's, it's no longer that the United States is clawing its way to the top and doing so on the backs of Chinese people, on black people, on working people as a whole. Now it is trying to remain on top by pushing down on everyone and targeting certain groups, certain nations that dare to, uh, quote unquote, threaten the legitimacy of this empire, whether it's just by existing or whether it's by outright policy, like we see with China, which is uh, growing rapidly, but also alleviating poverty and also attempting to address the environment and also trying to build a world order based on peaceful development and cooperation and multipolarity and all of these terms that are becoming more and more known because the differences between the two countries and the way that they treat the rest of the world is becoming that much more clear. So that's the big difference. It's not really a disagreement. It's really an addition. But in terms of what we do, I mean, I think that the, the Chinatown piece is a really good question. I think there are activists in the United States that attempt to build solidarity with Chinatown based organizations, Chinese organizations. I think of course that is very important work, but at the level of uh, perhaps if that's not accessible, cause not everyone lives near a Chinatown in the United States, let's say, uh, I think combating the misinformation and where I focus is on China. Uh, I think that is just so critical right now because while it's really difficult to quantify, we're not going to get a peer-reviewed study on the correlation and causation uh, models of whether anti-China uh, uh, media propaganda in the U.S. mainstream media is causing 
anti-Asian or anti-Chinese violence, it's pretty clear that if we just study history, and Brian, you mentioned some historical examples, when there is a breakdown of solidarity, when we don't remember the fact that it was black activists, black leftists, it was anti-war activists that were trying to build solidarity at certain periods in, in the U.S., with countries targeted by war. When we forget that history, and then we also forget the fact that, yes, there is this long track record that the United States has of super exploiting labor like Chinese workers from the period of warrior, and there was a huge hello, yellow peril ideology that justified it. And when we forget that history and we witness that breakdown of solidarity, it becomes much harder to combat the misinformation. So there has to be, I think, a focus on the misinformation. And uh, two, uh, I believe, and this is one thing I really want to become more committed uh, around since I have traveled to China a couple times in the last four years, building up those people-to-people -people exchanges. Because on the one hand, yes, we do need to be combating anti-Asian racism, anti-Chinese racism in the U.S. I think it's a big lesson from Warrior. And at the same time, on the foreign policy front, in my opinion, that there's a lot of root cause there that needs to be addressed. And there also is this danger of a hot war where the future could be so much brighter if there was a mass movement to stop that. So I do believe that one of the biggest challenges that we face is building more connections like these, being able to cut across the boundaries, the so-called borders, be able to connect with people in, you know, and restore maybe even more robust ties. We're going to have to go beyond now the business and the economic ties. We need to, we need to make sure we protect those. We, we oppose the economic warfare, the decoupling, de-risking, all of that. None of that benefits anybody except warmongers at this point so mm. we need to put all of that but we need to build relationships that are more robust that are more i think um attentive to the fact that uh, uh there is a huge gap right now in knowledge like when 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 i when i went last went to china i felt like i was the only american on a delegation inside of a country that had basically been shunned by the United States. It felt like that. It felt like the United mm. States, you could feel how intensely the United States has detached itself from China in order to prepare for a war with China. And that mm. wow. hits you in the face when you go to China because it is not of China's doing. There is, there is just a need now to, to defend oneself in China's perspective and that all falls at the feet of U.S. foreign policy right now. So we do need to build more connections so we can understand the effects of U.S. foreign policy better. And so we can combat misinformation from a human perspective. We can talk all day about sanctions and militarization and the threat of nuclear war. And what is China doing inside of China that we can humanize China around and, and tell a more balanced picture? But unless we're building true ties, people to people ties, they're, they're really, it's really going to be hard for people to relate here in the United States where life is very, very, very different and, and, yeah. and, and very different in, in, in unfortunate ways, really. A lot more isolated yeah. here. There's a lot more individualism. There's a lot more misinformation, uh, contrary, to, <laughs> contrary to what many people might believe. There's just a lot of challenges and obstacles. So without the people to people ties, uh, it's going to be enormously difficult to uh, face down this aggressive posture, but it can be done and it should be done. And I think that uh, projects like this and uh, connecting on all sorts of different levels, cultural, political, social, economic, all of it is needed. And I believe it's going to really take off in the next several years because I don't see the U.S.'s posture at the level of the government and its economy. I don't see that changing anytime soon, which, of course, leaves open a huge lane for people who really do care about peace to step in and do the work. Thanks, Danny.
great sharing, great insights. Um, I totally agree. People to people really needs to be the foundation of this. Part of the reason why we started Radii back um, almost six years ago now is because there's a belief that policymakers make decisions based on their own values, on their own perceptions of people. And if you can't humanize people and help them to understand uh, that these people are not that different, have the same needs and wants as, as yourself, you're not going to be compassionate nor understanding towards them. So you got to start with culture because that is something that that Chops uses where, you know, music is universal. You know, entertainment is is uh, entertaining to all of us. Um, a good visual is going to pull us in regardless if we're from, you know, U.S., China or anywhere else in the world. And that's a starting point. So culture, uh, I think, oftentimes can be the foundation of building that familiarity and trust. And again, um, speaking of culture, I want to move now to Chops, and we're going to finish with Dana after Chops. Um, Chops, I mean, you're in this industry. So, you know, hearing Shannon's quote and thinking about your own life uh, and what you've been doing, um, tell us kind of how, how how you see this and how you would approach it. Um, uh, I don't I don't know that I have any uh, additional thoughts on the quote. Um, yeah, I, I think I kind of follow what uh what the guy said what carl and danny said but um one thing i do want to say is is uh like uh, I, st I started out and I, we talked about this briefly one-to-one -one, but um uh, i started out uh as a social psychology major so i was interested in things like media and how it affect people how it affects people and how uh the portrayal of of uh of people and their characters is is really uh impactful on on how we perceive each other you know we we get our information through things like tv shows we get our information you know through uh what's what we receive what, what's available to us and um and like i i've i've always loved uh, music more than more than that right the 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 social psychology psychology aspect of it but um and and I've always thought that like as long as I could make someone's head nod, if as long as I could make like make them dance a little bit or like you know make them kind of groove a little, then like that's my contribution. You know what I mean? And and like that's enough for me. But like um, you know, as of late, being involved with a show like Warrior, uh, getting the opportunities to to c contribute some of the music, um, and and like even just meeting people like you guys you know uh that are that are doing things like radii and and like you know having the discussions that that you danny are having um and uh, and of course uh um learning about the history from from folks like you carl and and dana being able to get the chance to work and and like create things that could actually i don't know do a little bit more than that you know and and like not just um not just uh not just make you kind of shake your butt or whatever you know what i mean and and maybe make you think a little bit or like like you guys were saying have those one to one relationships where where when you learn about someone you're like you know what that person is all right like they're not that much different than me um in their di you know like we we have different situations we we come from different places um but like at the core like we you know we're trying to get through the day and have have a good day you know what i mean and and like and you know we want better for the for the people that we love and and when when we when we learn that we love someone that we didn't know we loved like we want better for them too mm -hmm. so I, I think that's Absolutely. about that's about all i have to say that's a great message thanks chops for sharing that now we got a special treat um showtime said he wants to uh, do a little something for us as we as we wrap this up. So Dana, Mike's all yours. Cool. Yeah, I'll just share a few words uh, just to kind of close. First of all, um, shout out to Shannon Lee and everything that she does, uh, carrying on her father's legacy. Uh, she's such an important role model and influencer, and just want to send love and light to her. And I, I definitely look forward. To, I'm sure on behalf of Chops as well. Uh, working directly with her more in the future. She does a lot, um, uh, much more than I think a lot of people know. And, uh, you, you know, keeping that legacy alive 
you know, all over the world. So she's an important bridge builder. Um, you know, about the personal connections, I listen to Olivia Chang and Jason Tobin, uh, actors on the show, on podcasts, share their personal stories of how their lives are paralleling the show. And it was very touching and moving. And a lot of things that they said I could relate to because, um, you know, I'm in that world. I'm connected to the Chinese community in China and in the United States. And there's so much more I want to talk about. It's, it's so moving. So I'm looking forward to having more of these, these conversations. And some of the people that we brought in uh, to the show, um, Pak T is from Xi'an, that's Northwest China. Kiga is from Inner Mongolia, that's Northern China. Yao Yao is from Qinghai, that's next to Tibet. Nunu is from Guizhou, she's from Hmong, and that was just last year. There's a whole new set of people that are from all over China and in the United States, uh, people of Chinese descent in L.A., uh, you know, our homeboys that the, the work with Chops and some of the songs that are all connected to the Iron Mike family. I literally, like in terms of what we can do, um, I, we have to do a better job of disproving the haters. When, when they say you can't, you have to show them and shove it in their face how wrong and how ignorant they are for saying that these these things can't be done because they're being done. I literally am part of a team of people that are building a Chinatown in Detroit. We're building a Chinatown in the city of Detroit. Um, and that's a that's an international effort from a young man from Wuhan that just happened to go to school in Michigan and get into real estate and hook up with a local African-American real estate developer and develop the idea to, to have a, you know, to, uh, a, a Chinatown development and make a festival to promote it, a music festival. So in 2019, I was just back in Detroit bringing artists from China to the city, uh, uh, promoting this and going around to Chinatowns in America to learn more about what's happening and learn more about the community. I went to LA, I hooked up with Chops. We did shows in a, in, in a church, in a non-denominational church, a multi-faith church that brought together people of all different faiths. We promoted our culture. I went to San Francisco. I hooked up with Ghazi at Empire to do a distribution deal. So we're making all of these connections and, and really defying the odds. Um, I just brokered a deal with Tencent. That's the largest tech company uh, in all of Asia. And this is the 50 year uh, anniversary of hip hop. That's something that needs to be celebrated in the 50. This is one of the biggest deals in hip hop history for a foundational black American and uh, the Senate of slavery to come to China and broker this mega deal, seven figure deal with the biggest tech company to promote hip hop in China. We're, we're impacting millions of people. I'm looking at our streams and something like 83 million streams recently, and that's small in China. And so I, I want to send a message uh, specifically to my community, to my brothers and sisters in the FBA and ADOS community. You know, recently I got to a little spat with this guy, um, Talib Rashid or whatever his name, Tariq Rashid, um, you know, this ex-pimp, uh, uh, ex-failed uh, rapper who, you know, wanted to make, you know, jokes about China. And, and he kind of tells half the story. He says that, you know, the good part is he talks about Muhammad Ali and the Black Panthers and the connections that we have. Uh, you know, with Asian people, but his spin on it is we never get the, uh, any reciprocity. They would never stand out for us. And that's just absolute bullshit. That's a lie because um, I'm living proof. My story is proof that, that that's not true. I know General Motors, Nike and Apple, all those guys are over here in China. They're doing, you know, crazy numbers better than a lot of the U.S. numbers. And a lot of them are empowering people from our community. I just partied the other, you know, couple weeks ago in the club with Allen Iverson. He came over here because he knew he needed to connect and build bridges with people. Uh, Stefan Marbury is still here. He's doing well, really well. Uh, the, you know, they're supporting his, his everything that he does back in him. James Harden is over here right now partying like a rock star. He, uh, you know, I went to Michigan State. There was a mass shooting in Michigan State. There was a young Chinese student that was shot at the mass shooting. James Hardison Harden saw that and realized this guy was a fan of his, invited him to the game, gave him some sneakers. And now James Harden is in China every single day partying like a hip hop rap, rap star. He's, he's getting nothing but love. Kyrie Irving got shunned and blacklisted 
He didn't have a deal with Nike. Where does he go? He comes to China and makes one of the most uh, important sneaker deals in history. So we are already providing the solution. We are already providing the example of how uh, you defy the odds. And we're going to keep on doing it. And, you know, we're working on our next deal with Tencent. We just put out 56 songs, me and Chops. We just produced 56 songs in like less than a month. Uh, 25, uh, 35 artists from 25 different cities, most of them in China. And we do that in a month. Let's ramp it up. Let's do uh, 560 songs, the next one. And we're going to do a song for Ratty Eye. We're going to do a song for the uh, Silk and Steel podcast. We're going to do a song for my man Danny. We're going to get all of our brothers and sisters from across the globe connected with you guys to promote you and your causes. And I want to leave with a little poem I wrote, a little, you know, a little rap that kind of encapsulates the spirit of warrior and tells the story actually from a first person perspective, or from the perspective of a Chinese person that's going through this. And it goes like this. I say, searching for gold mountains. We came over by the thousands. Chinatown was public housing. The mission and bitches of riches flowing like a fountain. Fleeing the indignity of indemnities. Celestial beings in the midst of war and peace. Strangers from a different shore. We crossed the Pacific to escape the British opium wars. Now open freedom's doors. Open freedom's doors. We sought refuge amongst the tongs, lion dances, and firecrackers, games of chances kept us strong, ready to box with our arms. Boxing with Bolo in the dojo, Chino with Loco, prize fighting for the promo. My advice was to breathe slow, capture the flow, because you will never know when it's your time to go, searching for mountains of gold. Love and light, Showtime from the Iron Mike. Thank you guys for putting this All together. Right. <laughs> Fire. Thanks, Dana. That was awesome. What a great way to finish. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Danny, for co-hosting. This is a really, really uh, fantastic session. Um, you guys know where to find Danny, obviously, uh, that are that are watching the stream here. Carl Ja has his own podcast. I'm sure most of you know it's Silk and Steel. Um, Dana Showtime Burton, I, his handle will be put in the caption um, so you guys can find him. In Chops, I saw somebody put in his uh, link to, to his music site, but we'll make sure to put that in the caption. In Radii, you guys can find us on radii.co and also our social media handles um, we'll add. So this has been fantastic. I really do hope there's a season four to um, Warrior, but let's finish up season three. The last episode, I think, is this week. Uh, and it is it is crazy, man. That show, it just... Uh, it's, <laughs> you can't get enough. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up. Danny, we good? Yeah, we're good. Just, uh, thanks everyone. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, make sure that you're dropping all the likes and, uh, oh, Carl is saying something. So Carl, <laughs> go ahead. No, uh, okay. I was just going to say, Brian, we should do a show. We should do a show just on the historical background of the warrior. Cause there's so much. Like I, yeah. I, I, I just barely scratched the surface on my talk <laughs> here because there's so much material there. Let's make it happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, everyone who's watching, make sure that you're liking, sharing, liking the stream, sharing it, uh, leaving a comment before you go on both of the channels. And uh, we'll, we'll end here. Good night. Good morning, wherever you are. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks so much.